Well, good evening and welcome to Yada Yawa. Yeah, well, we're uh, uh, here uh, to jump back into uh, Mismore Psalm 81. A couple of items, though, in the news before we uh, do. Um, first, a friend of mine sent me a news article about uh, uh, Southern California now has water police. Uh, you live in California, and maybe they're even in your community. But once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away, uh, I always thought that uh, the purpose of the water department was to provide water. And if you were, used water, you were a customer, and they were the uh, the supplier. Uh, but no, now they have water police riding around cars, guzzling, of course, uh, gas, polluting the, uh, the skies to tell you uh, all the ways that you can't use their product. And rather than than uh, simply supplying more uh, more uh, water, uh, which is not difficult to do, there's exactly the same amount of water on the planet uh, uh, that there was a billion years ago. Uh, this is uh, not rocket scientists here. Exactly the same amount of water. Uh, there's no way you can conserve water. You can't waste water. Uh, water is exactly the same as it was uh, a billion years ago. Uh, it's only a matter of distribution. So mm -hmm. in the sea, it's, uh, it's salt water. Uh, you can resolve that by desalinization plants. You can make water uh, for uh, a fraction of a, uh, of a penny uh, in the desalinization plants. You can, uh, I live on an island. Uh, some of our water that isn't captured by rain in our cisterns is... Uh, uh, I purchase, and if it's desalinized, desalinized water, I pay, buy it for about five cents a, uh, a gallon, and it's made for uh, one tenth of that. Uh, but they're not investing in those. Uh, they could dig out their reservoir so that when they have uh, surplus, uh, yeah, they uh, they could store it. Mm -hmm. But no, they just let their reservoirs uh, silt in. Uh, they could build more aqueducts, but no, there's probably some smelt somewhere that would uh, would complain and get a good lawyer, yep. and that would be it. But once upon a time, uh, the world wasn't as uh, backwards as it used to be, uh, doing the wrong thing as opposed to supplying more water, trying to control people's lives. Uh, speaking of controlling, about a year ago, um, I uh, led into a show where one of the five or six news topics was uh, Hunter Biden's um, laptop. And I had said that uh, that the claims that had been made by uh, Trump during the election that Hunter Biden was up to no good in, uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, and also into China and was benefiting financially from it and that his dad was all over it as well, that that had been uh, found and it seemed to uh, substantiate the claims. Well, um, the first thing that... Uh, Zuckerberg and company did is they uh, um, uh, pulled the uh, that show off. They uh, they banned me and they uh, pulled the show off uh, because, well, it was called election meddling. Well, the last time I checked, the election had taken place over a year prior to me doing the story, uh, and uh, um, I don't have a political Please. candidate. I'm anti-political. So I'm not trying to encourage anybody to do anything. I just want people to have uh, information. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this week, Zuckerberg was interviewed. And now that it's so obvious that uh, that laptop was filled with all sorts of, uh, of bad things and that Hunter Biden is uh, the living embodiment of scum. Uh, he, is, uh, he is so far worse and his dad's in so deeply in this. And it probably would have turned the election had the truth been known. Uh, so they were, he was interviewed recently, uh, and said, you know, why did you do this? Why did you ban people who even discuss this matter? He said, well, we had an FBI warning and the FBI said, beware of, uh, fake news. The federal government got into the censorship business. What he did. He didn't apologize for being wrong, by the way. He just said, uh, well, yeah. you know, now we just do what we tell if it had been, if it had been a claim against Trump, and the and the FBI said it's uh, be careful of false news. They would have paid no attention to it. It is, uh, it's a very different world, and a not a good world that we live in today. Um, just another item in the news is that uh, California and Washington State have both uh, committed 
uh, to phasing out gas vehicles by, uh, I think, 2030, which means all of those thousands of gas stations will be completely obsolete. All the people that work in those gas stations will be unemployed. Um, all of the refineries that make gasoline will be uh, shut, shut down. down. Yep. And you will have all these electric uh, cars without an electric grid that's capable of supporting them. And you haven't even bothered to realize that the electric car is, is more caustic to the environment than the gasoline car because it still takes the generation of, of energy, oh, which well, is typically yeah. from fossil fuels. So you're going to burn them one way or the other. And uh, uh, the second problem is that the batteries are so caustic to the environment, not only to create but to, uh, to uh, dispose of. But nonetheless, the progressives don't think. They think they have scored this this great victory, and yet you would say of the liberal politicians that are progressives, how many of them have ever designed a battery? How many of them have ever built a car? How many of them have ever made parts for a car? How many of them even worked for a company that made parts for a car? Or worked. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Or, yeah, or actually worked at a, uh, at a real job. So, yeah, a real job. You, uh, Kirk, said you found an, an article uh, in the uh, the news mm-hmm. that, that uh, validated uh, my uh, one of my two concerns. I have, uh, I have se- actually several concerns as it relates to the war in Ukraine, uh, principally that the United States started it and we started it uh, back in, in 2013 uh, mm-hmm. and that we've done it uh, deliberately uh and that uh, it's not Putin's war it is uh Obama's war and McCain, John McCain's war and Lindsey Graham's war and now uh Hunter Biden and Joe Biden's war uh and the second thing is if there ever was a country that we should be sacrificing billions of dollars for and and uh, every week they're asking for another 2 or 3 billion dollars to prop up both the government uh and the uh, and the weapons supply cash for this parasitic country. Uh, I can't imagine a country less deserving uh, than the Ukraine. Uh, Mm -hmm. They were uh, the bane of the world economic system, borrowing money and never paying it back. Uh, They were the government most noted for graft, uh, where more than 20% of the money is collected by their government or, or provided in loans or in aid were confiscated off the top. Uh, same thing is true if you uh, provide weapons to the Ukraine now. Uh, the majority of what you supply is, is taken by uh, uh, thugs, uh, most connected with the government. Uh, it is the birthplace of Hasidic uh, Judaism, which is the the worst variation of the religion, uh, probably in history. Uh, it is the country that was... Uh, anti-Semitic and ruthless towards the Jews far earlier and worse than even Nazi Germany. And this is the country that we want to set up as the bastion of democracy that that's, uh, we should uh, supply all manner of weapons so that they can uh, bludgeon the country with the most nuclear bombs while also throwing the entire world into financial chaos uh, with uh, with famines uh, now because of the lack of, of shipments of grain and also of fertilizers and with the huge disruptions and and fuel costs and all manner of dysfunctional sanctions. So that's been my uh, my gripe in that uh, and that we literally have a propaganda department in the US military and the US government feeding people erroneous information and most people don't question it and just buy it. And uh, that's coming it up. And mm-hmm. I think you found an article where the researcher verified much of what I have been saying over these uh, oh, verbatim. Almost, almost 10 uh, years he, now. Yeah. He, he uh, went into it only he called it. He was entitled. I'll, I'll give you a few little bullet points because it is rather long, but uh, it's called the corruption. And it is the into a black hole. Um, the corruption, uh, the corrupt olig- oligarchy of uh, Ukraine, mm-hmm. known as Ukraine, and, and he goes on and he cites. So uh, what he, he goes, he says, well, why? What is the end game for the U.S. on this? They have nothing there that can do anything for us 
and why why they're doing it. And he he, he answers his own uh, questions uh, with an uh, interview uh, with uh, uh, why they're doing it is uh, is exceedingly easy, which is that there's big yeah. money and the uh, and the military industrial complex and lots of oh, money yeah. for politicians and bribes and powers and favors, and uh, uh, NATO had no purpose. Uh, and so uh, to give NATO no, has a purpose. purpose and to uh, and to uh, justify buying more and spending more on weapons, we uh, we needed to uh, play the Cuban Missile Crisis again and arm the uh, Ukraine against Russia, prompting uh, a Russian invasion so that we could prime the military industrial complex and and then unite people as patriots and get them to sacrifice and uh, destroy the economy with inflation and all manner of things. So it's, so it's, yeah. it's all a control mechanism. Yeah. Well, he, he said, you know, he, he, he went from there to the defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, and this is about the article about two days ago. And he said, we want to see, we want to see Russia weaken to the degree that it can't do this kind of thing anymore. It's all about, uh, and it, it can't invade. So it won't invade Ukraine or, and then he goes on and on and on. It's the things that we do. He even mentioned, you know, we do that rather religiously. The United States does. We've invaded just about everybody, you mm-hmm. know, get our will uh, done. So and he, he at least was uh, good enough to bring that up as well. And he said the sanctions have been a total failure, uh, zero impact on the Russian advances uh, on the battlefield and changed Russia uh, and, or changing any of Russia's goals on the Ukraine. And he cited things like uh, – uh, they turned around and they sold all their oil that we had put sanctions on. They sold it to China and they sold it to India. They also, by the way, sold it to uh, Japan this week or last week. No um, so, I mean, there's no choice. So they can't they can't affect them. In no, that no. Way. The, the Russian local... economy is is booming. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It, 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 and to continue with sanctions when all they have done is is punish the West and have had no effect on uh, on Russia. And have actually formed partnerships with Russia that are counterproductive to the West is insane. Again, it's the problem of, uh, of progressiveness, of not being able to put facts together and think rationally. Um, yeah, the whole thing is yeah. uh, is just upside down. We are everything we're doing is having the opposite effect of what we intended. You yeah. know, I was of the uh, of the uh, conviction early that that with Russia invading the Ukraine. Uh, that uh, China would take that as the opportunity to uh, invade to Taiwan because the West could not afford to sanction both China and Russia simultaneously, and so and nor could they uh, fund uh, two wars simultaneously, so that that was the natural entree, entree for uh, for China. Certainly, China is doing a lot mm-hmm. of stable rattling, rattling in in that regard right now, uh, but yeah. I, I think the reason that China is delaying is that the United States is becoming so weak uh, in uh, in this war against Russia, uh, and it's so disastrous for the U.S. economy uh, that they're biding their time because uh, it's better for them to wait us out and let us bleed ourselves dry uh, before uh, uh, invading, Uh, particularly once Americans get to realize that uh, all we did is make a bad situation worse in the Ukraine, and so why do we want to do the same thing in Taiwan? Now the difference is night and day. The Taiwanese people deserve our support, uh, and uh, um, we placed it a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, it, it it is uh, it's an entirely different situation. But there is nothing the United States can do to protect Taiwan. We can't uh, sanction uh, China. We can't go to war against China. So what's all the rhetoric for? Um, yeah. You know, the only reason that China right now has not invaded Taiwan is it's so costly. Now, China mm-hmm. uh, has a real problem right now. The, uh, the Yangtze uh, River is, uh, is dried up, uh, and their water supply has dried up, and they've got hundreds of millions of people that will soon uh, be uh, threatened with life and death issues over a lack of water. Uh, and it's uh, it's ransacking the economy, destroying their electric grids. So China is in a real mess. And you wonder, how are they going to resolve that? Because what countries typically do when uh, they can't supply either food or water or shelter, 
uh, for people and, and you create anarchy. And right now you even have Chinese banks that are failing and, and uh, issues uh, in that regard. Is they go to war. That's correct. They go mm-hmm. to war. Um, well, they do it in so, India, India and Pakistan do it all the time over water. Right. You know, yeah, and so the United place. States. You know, I had my fact mm-hmm. checker, uh, Mike, sure. uh, correct something that I'd written. I, I had written that in the last 60 years, America had been in, engaged, the only country engaged, and I think I had 12 wars. And he says, are you kidding? Let me list them for you. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. It's more like, uh, you know, 25 or or 30 wars in, uh, in the last 60 years. We're, we're just all over the place. And then oh, yeah. we blame, you know, Russia for invading uh, Ukraine when, what in the hell were we doing in Afghanistan? What were we doing in Somalia? What were we doing in Iraq? What are we doing in in uh, Syria? Just making bad situations worse? You know, what did we do in Libya? Yeah. Well, what what did we accomplish in Vietnam? What did we accomplish in Korea? So we're, what, why did we invade Grenada? <laughs> I mean, come on. I don't mean yeah. that. All right. Well, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, yeah, it's I was testimony because uh, certainly man's make uh, no sense. Uh, one uh, yeah. good news is that uh, JB is uh, in the uh, the chat room. We uh, JB and oh, I hey, JB. Some emails here uh, recently, so it's uh, it is nice to have uh, JB back and uh, uh, and uh, uh, here with us. In fact, I think he just uh, chimed in. Hello, JB. How are you? Hey, doing good. I was just keeping yeah. myself muted until I had something to say, so you didn't get all the background noises. Oh, okay, yeah, you're uh, you've, hey. uh, you're still in uh, outside of Dallas, uh, planning on moving one of these days, and uh, have a uh, got a, it on a, about a, a two-year uh, plan right now. <laughs> okay, you have a good new job, and they're trying to uh, have you uh, do some administration kinds of things, and you're doing some additional studying and qualification to be ready for that. Yep. Yeah, they're sending me these trainings, well, and they want to move me up, so it's. Working out really great. Uh, congratulations. Great. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. Keeping me busy, though. <laughs> yep. Lots of people were uh, were questioning uh, what what happened yeah. to JB. What happened? And I, uh, yeah. And I, what happened was that uh, he's got a new job and and that uh, lots of studying and preparation mm, for busy. the yeah the opportunity. Life got busy, and that's also what and happened. My daughter just keeps me family. constantly busy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Lots of good things. So this is where we were at the end of our uh, program last week. It's those who demonstrably shun and slight, who are adverse and disdain, thereby actively causing others to deny, if the word is sane, Yahweh will be considered worthless and will be rejected by him. And in the, and in the way they experience time, that will continue to exist that way, forevermore throughout eternity. So God is telling us it's quid pro quo. If you shun me and you encourage others to devalue who I am, then I am going to view you as worthless. It's exceedingly fair. Uh, In fact, if I were God, I don't think I would let them off that lightly. Uh, here you are, you're, you're God, you create the universe, you conceive life, uh, you interact with your creation uh, and uh, you know, initially with Adam and then with uh, Noah and his family. Uh, you go form a relationship with the only fellow you can find that's actually willing to walk away from religion and politics and his uh, wife. You promise them everything an eternity with you, uh, here mm-hmm. the entire universe. And he's not the smartest tool in the shed, and he does some dumb stuff, but you still honor your agreement with him. He's the best you could find. And uh, uh, you do the same thing with his sons and with his son's uh, son, and, and, and all you get is grief. They're belly aching. They're, uh, they're off worshiping false gods. I mean, can you imagine being a real God? You do everything for your people, and they choose instead to ignore you and go off and build shrines to and idols of, mm-hmm. of fake gods. And then they write tomes about these fake gods and make donations to them. They sacrifice even um, their own children to yeah. them. 
and and all you say is, I will consider you worthless. No, I would I would go. A, well, I, I don't lot. know what a black hole is like yet, but she is going to be uh, probably less. Yeah, that I mean, that, <laughs> that seems, quite thorough. Yeah. Yeah, eternal separation uh, in Sheol sounds like a a much more fitting uh, answer, but. One of the things that is not well understood is that the reason that you don't find Yahweh's name in any English Bible, uh, nor ever discussed in any religious uh, circles, is that it's bad for business. Uh, Rabbinic Judaism is literally based on this idea of, uh, of replacing Yahweh with rabbis. And if you know God's name and you know that he is approachable and you know that he's trying to form a relationship with you, he's trying to educate you, to teach you, to guide you, uh, and he wants to guide you away from the religious and to him, well, the first thing you do if you're the religious is you deny his name, which is what they've done. But that would make particularly the first to do it, which would be uh, religious Jews, the most anti-Semitic people in the world. Correct. And that's a bold statement, but uh, Shem means name. The people yes. who were the most aggressive at denying Yahweh's name, the very people that Mizmor Psalm 8115 was written for, are Jews. So religious Jews are responsible for denying Yahweh. You won't find his name in the Jerusalem Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud, in the Zohar, in the Mishnah, any one of their sermons or speeches. Find it nowhere. And so God says, uh, based upon what you have done to negate me, I will simply view you as worthless. But then that bottom line is uh, suggestive of the penalty because it says the way they experience time now will be the way they'll experience time throughout eternity. So their days now are consumed being religious. So the only way that you can eternally be religious is to spend your eternity in Sheol, hell, which will be an exceedingly religious place, uh, eternally separated mm -hmm. from God. So for having shown such sanity in enmity toward the Almighty and discarding him, uh, which is what they have done to accommodate their religion, religious Jews will be considered kashaf, which is so worthless they will be kashesh, shunned and slighted, discarded and tossed away like yesterday's trash. Now, if you are a Gentile, you are a Christian or a Muslim, and you say, "Yeah, see, I told you." Yeah, and then you need to know that the difference <laughs> between God, yeah. yeah, God reprimanding religious Jews and you is that He didn't care anything about you in the first place, and He cares nothing of you now, and He will care nothing about you later. So if you are a Gentile and you are a Muslim or you are a progressive, you are a Christian, you are a Hindu, you are a communist, God never knew you, never cared about you, isn't about to change and have any interest in you, and will never, ever reach out to you or try to uh, be a benefit to you. So you're just always worth nothing to God. With the Jews, it is a different story. At one time, they were exceedingly loved by and valued by Yahweh, which no Gentile can claim. Now, it's, until quite recently, there are a number of Gentiles that have become part of the covenant family, but prior to that, no. And God is saying that, that now, the way you are, you are not lovable. You're not worth investing in. You've negated me. I negate you. But with Jews, the difference between a religious Jew and a Gentile is that 
there are going to be some Jews, non-religious ones, but like Abraham that have walked away from religion and politics, that God is going to reconcile his relationship with in the last days. So the difference is, while he is disgusted by them, he once loved them and he will love them again. Where with the Gentile Christians, Gentile uh, progressives, Gentile communists, Gentile Muslims, never knew you, never had any regard for you, and will never know you or have any regard for you. So there is a significant difference, and we have to be careful when we are explaining why God is so frustrated with his people, because it is the number one theme throughout the prophets. God is disgusted by his people being religious and discounting him in favor of false gods through their religion. But that does not mean that he did not once love them, and it does not mean that he will not love them again, because he did, and he will. But if you want to be among those who are loved, then you're going to have to forego Judaism. So for the crime of having encouraged their brethren to disavow Yahweh's name, severing their relationship with God, the rabbis are going to spend an eternity separated from Yahweh. For having feigned their relationship with God, for an eternity of time, rabbis will cower and cringe in Sheol. Venerated by Jews here on earth, these rabbis will be rejected by God forevermore. The message is that religion is not only a victimless, is not a victimless crime, that there is a consequence of imposing it. And those who promote it are going to be held accountable. Those who sought for others to bow down before them, to cower in their presence, to give them money, well, they're going to be compensated in kind. They will be impoverished, and they will be the ones bowing down. It should not have been this way. And I think it was one week ago, and uh, as we were uh, covering this uh, 81st Mismore, that in the 81st mm -hmm. Mismore, there's a reference to the waters of Meribah. And so I yes. want to tell you the story of the waters of Meribah because it's one of the most interesting uh, and yet um, damning experiences among the Jews. And to, to set the scene, uh, Yahweh had intervened. The, uh, the, the Jews had ticked off the, uh, let's call them Egyptians. They're actually Mitzra and Mitzraim. But they had been there and, uh, and were for about 40 years were well-received, a, um, a valuable part of the community. Uh, but they must have been about as charming with uh, the Egyptians as they subsequently were with God. And so the Egyptians said, hey, you know, I think we got a problem with these people uh, and we're going to have to deal with it. And they ended up being enslaved. And the conditions got worse and worse over time. Uh, and so God intervened. He cannot stand it when uh, people combine religion and politics to deprive people of free will uh, and mm -hmm. to burden them in this way. So God is a liberator. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, this is not going to do. He went and he liberated his people from that experience. And they hadn't been free from it uh, but a matter of weeks, and they were already worshiping false gods. And along the way, God said, listen, I can't take this group of people into the promised land, into my home, because they couldn't even exist for a week without <clears throat> going off and being religious. So he said, yeah, I think all I can do is, is to – prolong this period of time, let this original generation pass away, and, uh, and then bring the next generation into the promised land. It didn't turn out any better, but the point was, uh, was made. One of the great falling outs between God and his people occurred at uh, <coughs> the waters of Meribah. 
So here is that story. <coughs> For it, um, uh, we uh, will turn to Bob Midbar, which means uh, in the wilderness or where the word is uh, questioned, uh, Numbers 20. <coughs> Here's where the discussion begins. And the entire community, children of Yisrael, came to the desert of Sin in the first and foremost month. And the people dwelt in Kadesh, where Miram uh, died. That would be uh, Moshe's Moshe's sister. Uh, Moshe's sister, I'm sorry. Moshe's sister, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Aaron's uh, sister as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Miram died and was buried. Okay. So the entire community, that would be all of uh, the children of Israel. Israel, in this case, would uh, mean those who struggle and strive against uh, Almighty God. They were in the lifeless wasteland of sin, uh, which is thorn and barb. It's used to prick, to prod, and to goad in the first and foremost month. Uh, that would be Abib. So it's springtime. And the people mm-hmm. uh, dwelt in uh Kadesh, which means to be set apart and separated, where Miram, which uh, means rebellion and bitterness, uh, died and was buried. So there are some lessons in sin, uh, because uh, sin, T-S-I-N, is a thorn, uh, like the one that Paul said was in his side when he admitted to being demon-possessed and controlled by Satan in his second letter to the Corinthians. It is also a goad, which is used to Uh, controlled and prod uh, dumb animals. Uh, It's one of the problems for Christianity because Paul cited the most famous line from Dionysus uh, Mm -hmm. during his conversion experience where uh, the famous line that Dionysus said, it's uh, difficult to kick against the goat. Uh, Paul Mm -hmm. put those words in uh, and his God's mouth is actually Satan. the, the line from Euripides' poem is to say that in a religious community, and that's why Dionysus is quoted saying it, in a religious community, it is exceedingly difficult for you to step out of line and to rebel against that goad that is controlling all the, uh, the dumb animals uh, uh, because it's so pervasive in the society and, uh, and it's literally part of the fabric of that society. It's like uh, questioning America's uh, role in uh, the Ukraine or in Afghanistan when that war was raging or or Iraq or or Vietnam when that war was raging. Uh, The patriots will come and attack you. Uh, It's like uh, uh, explaining that Christianity is a false religion or that Islam is uh, is a complete uh, farce. very difficult to do those. Look at Salman Rushdie. Very difficult to do those kinds of things. There are consequences for telling the truth, and that was uh, what Dionysus said. You know, okay, so our religion is is nothing but myths. But try to oppose it and see what happens to you. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the uh, the worst things that Paul did in his life was put those words in his uh, God's mouth, and uh, and yet nary a person holds him accountable. This um, account goes on to say in the next statement, uh, this would be uh, 22. There had not been any water for the community, so they were gathered and assembled uh, against Moshe, drawn out, and to oppose Eric, the alternative. And then the people quarreled in opposition, ridiculing and mocking while being uh, contentious towards Moshe. Uh, before we read the rest of this, keep in mind that uh, mm-hmm. we humans don't last very long without water. Uh, we can go 40, 50, 60 days without food. Some of us that are packing on a few pounds could probably go longer than that and probably be good for us. But without water, it's just a matter of days and, and, and our health deteriorates rapidly. So um, for them, particularly in the desert, to say they were without water and they were functional and still moving around and camping out. And then the source of water had just dried up. Um, 
because if it had dried up three days ago, this conversation would be laying down. Happening. Right. So this yeah. is this is uh, yeah. I was saying, uh, you know, I, I'm supplying them with everything: their food, their uh, their shelter, uh, their water, everything. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> let's just see what happens if we uh, if we turn off the tap of water for a day or two. Well, this is what uh, transpired. They began ridiculing and mocking, being contentious towards Moshe, which is exactly what happened 40 years earlier when Moshe put mm -hmm. his neck out in the line and, and stopped the taskmaster from uh, beating a, uh, a Hebrew. Uh, and the Hebrews turned on him. They were contentious against Moshe saying, what right do you have to intervene in our lives and to tell us what to do? Anyway, these, uh, these uh, children of Israel, they protested and said, if only we had perished along with the death of our brothers in the presence of Yahweh. These a-holes were saying that we'd have been better off being killed when uh, Yahweh uh, ended the lives of those who were worshiping uh, the golden cow. Golden cow, yeah. Yeah. Immediately after uh, freeing them from Israel or from Egypt, they go right back and start worshiping the Egyptian gods. And uh, and God says, oh, that's where you want to play. Then you would have died there. I'll just take this cancer out here because it will metastasize and destroy this entire community. He wiped them out. And these jerks are saying, we'd have been better off if but God had killed us back then no thank you god for freeing us from the worst situation in the world no god thank you for wiping out the uh the egyptians uh, army pursuing them no thank you for uh for feeding us along the way and uh teaching us along the way and, and being actually god and being with us and helping us none of that nope now we're gonna pull a zuckerberg on you uh, we're uh, we're not going to talk about any of that. We're just going to say we've been better off dead and uh, let you kill us rather than you liberate us. Now, that's exceedingly disgusting. I, if I were God, I would say, all right, uh, that's what you want. No problem. I'm I'm here to accommodate. <laughs> here, here. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm just saying that's that's what that's I guess the reason I'm not God. I'd be I'd be lousy at it. <laughs> yeah, that would be really smart. But it seems it seems to be a pretty reasonable response to uh, to make. It is. It is. Uh, yeah. Fair. Um, I'm not even sure that if I were God for a day and pulled that response, that God would even be miffed uh, at uh, at the at the response. So early in Exodus, well. And Moshe was receiving the Torah on the summit of Mount Torah. Wayward Israelites uh, rejected the God who had saved them, and they built an idol in the form of a golden calf to worship the sun god they had been subjected to in Mitzrayim. As a consequence, Yahweh shortened their immortal existence, in essence, canceling the gift of life he had extended to them. Having learned nothing from the lesson, their survivors said they would have been better off if they had died right around along with their misguided brethren. Uh, that's an intelligent response, isn't it? <sighs> but it's You're actually worse. Me too. Yeah, it, it's really worse than that because the Israelites will still harboring animosity against Yahweh. They were blaming mm -hmm. God for truncating the lives of those he had liberated. And yeah, we already had a conspiracy theory. Rather than accept responsibility for having spit in God's face, for doing the single worst thing anyone could have done at this moment, being religious, they would have preferred the fate of those Yahweh exposed and condemned. And that's the nature of religion. That's what it does to people. It is mm -hmm. it's an exceedingly befuddling and toxic uh, beast inebriating, affecting uh, the judgment of, uh, of everyone. Um, moreover, they were identifying with and longing for their own brethren, not Yahweh, which is their preference today. That's 
why they prefer to listen to their brethren speak through the pages of the Talmud than to listen to Yahweh speak to them through the Torah. It is apparent that the waters of Meribah is prophetic. It's depicting what is occurring between the Heredi and Yahweh at this very moment. Rather than admit that their religion is an affront to God and that they are wrong, rabbis claim that they speak for, well, let's say, G-D. And clearly, based upon the way that they congregate, where they live, how they dress, what they read, and who they spend their days listening to and venerating, the Heredi overwhelmingly prefer their own company to a relationship with Yahweh. Ultra-Orthodox Judaism is a cult parched of parched religious men who prefer their own even unto death. That's the reality. If you don't agree, go away. See, uh, see if Yahweh changes his mind regarding you. At this point, one can only assume that Yah would have been pleased to comply with their wishes, dispatching them as would be his preference today. And it is what he will eventually do. After all, yes. he was now witnessing the people he had rescued from religious and political oppression, taunting, mocking, insulting him by continuing to be religious. And they weren't just mocking him, they were mocking Moshe. God really doesn't like that. God's got really mm -hmm. big shoulders, and he's he doesn't expect much from us. He knows we're, eh, well, look how bad Abraham was, and he loved him. Look how bad Jacob was, and he loved him. Uh, yeah, God um, is exceedingly Texas. easy to please. Witnesses. Yeah, so uh, you really have to do a lot to take him off. Uh, but one of the things he really hates, uh, and the, the examples would be uh, Moshe and Dode, uh, and to some extent also Samuel. When God picks what he considers to be the best person for the job, he equips that person to do the job well. He does the job with them and through them. And you go off and you besmirch the individual that he has chosen to work with, who has been willing to work with him, who have devoted themselves to what God wants accomplished. And you attack that person. God's fuse is much shorter than if you just attack him. That's why when Paul came up with this myth of replacement theology and, and uh, deliberately took the titles that Yahweh afforded Dote, uh, the branch, the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, and gave them to this mythical character that he called Jesus Christ. Um, he said that, hey, you know, Dode's dead and buried. You can't expect anything from him. That kind of stuff really ticks God off. And so mm -hmm. these people took this man that God said, I want you to go and do this project with me, or uh, this is his, the guy that he's delivering his Torah through. Uh, you know, Moshe is, uh, I don't know if he's the greatest person who's ever lived or the second greatest person who's ever lived, uh, he but he's up there. there. Yeah, he's up there on the top yeah. too. And, and while well, uh -huh. I think Yahweh had uh, more compassion and, and uh, it was more vested, and uh, and Dode, who he got to know while he was uh, eight years old, um, and did so much with uh, with Dode over his life, um, uh, and Dode was far more of a rascal than Moshe. But these are the top two people in, in God's uh, list of of humans that He has engaged with, and for them to have treated Moshe this way. Um, uh, that uh, that was pushing the wrong buttons as it relates to uh, to God. So, 
as we look at this, I think you, you, what you ought to see is that Judaism, with their absurd claim that their religious text, the, uh, the Talmud, was somehow conveyed by God at the very time he was eliminating those who were religious for the crime of being religious. Just think about how the That's waters true. of Mirabar go so far as to disprove um, the um, particularly ultra-Orthodox Judaism uh, and their, uh, their love for their Talmud. Uh, because they will claim that their Talmud uh, is, is the, at the same level of authenticity and inspiration as the Torah and prophets given by the same, oh, what's his name, uh, at the same time that Moshe, Moshe received the rest of it uh, and it was given to the elders and just passed on. What are the chances of that when God is so anti, vehemently opposed to religion? Not a chance in Sheol. No. He's out there wiping the religious off the face of the earth. He most certainly isn't uh, giving them a religious text. So ponder the implications of Israelites preferring to die with their brethren than to live with God. And by the way, that's the way the Heredi are today. And then think about why there is no means to eternal life in heaven in Judaism, plan of salvation in Judaism. They would prefer to die with their religious can. As a matter of fact, they, the only time that the Haredi uh, get out of, uh, of their little communities is to do one of two things, either to spend the day bobbing up and down at the Western Wall uh, um, reciting some rote prayer, or they want to go to the grave of some uh, dead Jew. They, they really love their, uh, the dead Jews and their graves. They are, have not changed it's Mormon. Yeah, since this time. So these miserable and ungrateful bums didn't give their tongues a rest. They continued to demonstrate their disdain for God, further alienating themselves from the author of the Torah, the creator of life with each word. So, for what purpose did you bring Yahweh with this contingent into the desert so that we could die here along with our livestock? Numbers 24. Why did you bring Yahweh with us? Couldn't you have left God back there with the Egyptians? They're asking Moshe. Why did you bring God with us? The last thing we wanted was God. The only reason you wouldn't want God with you is because you prefer the fake ones. That's it. There's a reason that the Haredi never pray to Yahweh. There's a, and by the way, God wants you to pray, so I'm not encouraging that. But there's no. a reason they never speak of Yahweh. There's a reason they don't listen to Yahweh. So Yahweh she, gets yeah. in the way of their religion. These guys actually said to Moshe, why did you bring Yahweh with us? Well, the credit they still at least knew his name. I mean, I can't even imagine being in that position. But, you know, I spend 10 hours a day every day uh, sitting here in this chair celebrating Yahweh's words and the life and emancipation that they uh, enrichment they bring. Well, they didn't know the answer then, and they don't know it now. Uh, worse than is now, they prefer to complain and die surrounded by others who think like them than live with God. They were oblivious to the purpose of the covenant on that day, and they are on this day. Indeed, the stories of the waters of Meribah is prophetic of Judaism as it was and it remains. It is the thing that God hates most about his people. And it's the thing that defines them at this very moment. For what purpose did you withdraw us 
in such a grandiose manner. From Mitzrayim, these crucibles of political and religious oppression, to come with us to this horrible, good-for-nothing place. This is not a place for sowing seeds or for figs or for vines or for promagan- prom- uh, pomegranate. Pomegranate. It was yeah. easy for me to say, right? Pomegranate. <laughs> Ramon in, uh, in Hebrew. And besides all of that, there's nothing to drink. Well, how'd you like to play, Mrs. Lincoln? Oh, God. <laughs> he didn't say this was the promised land. You would have gone through this place you and could. have been in the promised land long ago if you just kept your yap shut. So this is not the place for sowing seed. This is not the place for figs. Not the place for vines or for prom- pomegranates. You're right. <laughs> yeah, you weren't even supposed to be here. You're only here because of your stinking, awful attitude. Which is why I didn't stand in the way of the Romans when they came and beat the living you-know-what out of them three times. Or stand in the way of the Muslims. Or stand in the way of the Nazis. Quite frankly, you're too busy flapping your lips and complaining. Nothing horrible, good for nothing place. Why did you even bring us here? And oh, by those those signs and wonders! What a grandiose display! I mean, these people are obnoxious. But by the way, they don't sound any different than uh, the speeches of the Herodim. If you listen to them, they sound just like this. Not even a lot different than the progressives as they complain and bellyache and uh, try to blame everybody else but themselves. I don't know, Kirk, you said you... uh, uh, picked a, a few of the words along the way to analyze to see if the, the translation conveyed the message that I'm reporting here. I don't know if uh, yeah. I've skipped over some of those that you have done and uh, just to give you a chance to uh, to share it. No, mostly. I mean, I, I thought what I do a lot of times in these sections is I'll, I'll hit real hard the first one if the time is short. And Maribal is absolutely... That, that significant place he talks about, I, I thought it was interesting. That sin was uh, a thorny, uh, uh, thorn up against uh, um, a seed or uh, children, if you want, and, and that sort of thing. So he sets the tone in, in Kadesh, which is close to close to uh, Kodesh, to be set apart, but it also can be separating from or separ- or joining to. Uh, is uh, so if you really look at those those words, which I enjoy doing. And, and I encourage, if you can't, don't have time to redo every word like I used to, look at the key words on the things, on these things that you start with, especially in the first few verses, and you'll find, my God, that's exactly what it says. And I, I do the letters as well, and it, and, it, and it reinforces the words. The words are, and, and you don't need a lot of lexicons to do it. And I have an inland area that I like to use yeah. as well. You know, so I can get it in order, and I can see the uh, the uh, grammar and so forth. So yeah. yes, the, um, these uh, I, these Jews were belly aching against God uh, in the most obnoxious way possible. So mm-hmm. Yahweh had been explicit with them. He had told them, and all who would listen, after liberating liberating them from religious and political oppression, that they were headed to the promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, and they would. Grow as a family and enjoy working together. Specifically is what he told them. God's agenda was clearly articulated vocally and in writing. However, the Israelites were deaf to God, as they are today. They prefer to listen uh, and be subject to the religious. It is as if they never left Mitzrayim. By using Ra, 
the mm -hmm. disgruntled Israelites were describing themselves rather than their location. This was just a place. Nature, even in its rawest form, inspires those who approach it with the right attitude. I, I for about a dozen years of my life, had uh, homes in uh, the Palm Desert, Palm uh, Springs area. Mm -hmm. Exceedingly arid. Uh, you know, if there ever was a desert, that's a desert. And no oh kidding. My God, was it been there? Burn up. Oh, yeah, it it's is. It's so gorgeous. There is beauty everywhere you look. But it's all about attitude. There's, there's really only one thing in life that's debilitating. That's having a bad attitude. That was really the first thing that Yahweh told Cain when, uh, you know, they first got out of the garden. He says, you know, if you have a good attitude, we're going to get along. But you've got a crappy attitude, and that's just the reason why I want nothing to do with you. And yet, really, even an unspoiled wilderness becomes hellish among those who are miserable. You begin to see the world as you are. It takes a special kind of rotten to prefer religion to a relationship with Yahweh, death to life, disagreeable to desirable. But they had one thing right. They were in the wrong place for a family to grow. Not very long ago, these ingrates had been slaves, mucking around in the mud. Now free, they were belly aching about everything, including the viability of the flocks they had been given. There was no pleasing them. It was as if they thought that the God who had defeated the Egyptian empire by drowning Flora, Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea was incapable of providing them with a little water. Yeah, mind you, they didn't ask. They didn't even say, uh, you know, we're out here. I'm expecting Yahweh to resolve this issue for us. Uh, yeah, you know, let's uh, let's see what we can do to get this uh, done. We are getting a little thirsty. Uh, it's been fine. You know, while it's a small detail in the midst of a much larger story, before they began to act up, the children of Israel were Ida. They were an enduring mm -hmm. witness to the restoring testimony. But now they had become Ka'al, a conditional community and mob. That's a, quite a demotion. And keep in mind that this is human dynamics. Individually, uh, we can be as, uh, uh, with Yahweh's help, uh, like Moshe was, extraordinary, exemplary. We have it in us to be special. But when we gr group together, uh, man becomes, and humankind, women as well, become almost universally bad. The larger the empire, the larger the institution, the worse it is. Group mm -hmm. dynamics and for humankind are not a good thing. So when the question is, is man basically good or bad? My answer would be that individual men and women can be both good and bad. But mm -hmm. collectively, men and women are almost always bad. Such was the case in this community. Moshe and Aaron moved away from the presence of the contingent community and mob to the doorway of the tent of the eternal witness to the appointed meetings, the Moed, and they dropped on their faces. The glorious yeah. presence of Yahweh appeared and was seen by them. Numbers 26. Moshe, I think I've shared, is, in my opinion, the most extraordinary person who's ever lived. Um, he had character. He was a great listener, a wonderful teacher, um, a tremendously courageous man. Um, he's smart. He had articulate. His values were in the right place. This is a really good dude. Uh, mm -hmm. That does not mean that everything he said and did was right. And 
it does not mean that everything that is said about him is something we should emulate. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of things that God talks about and his people do that are wrong. And in this case, uh, Moshe made two mistakes. And I don't have a problem sharing that because God wouldn't have told us this story if he didn't want us to analyze it and think it through. And it's not uh-huh. to say that Moshe is a bad guy. I think he's you know, one of the two most remarkable people in human history. But two mistakes. When people attack us for sharing Yahweh's words, for representing him, for caring about him, for trying to shake the religion out of people so that they are in a position to be receptive to Yahweh, and they turn on us, which is what most religious do. 99.9. Yeah, there is no reason to retreat. You know, I wrote Prophet of Doom in my own name. I received more death threats than Salman Rushdie. I don't retreat. I don't hide. When, when you're serving Yahweh in a meaningful way, doing something he wants done, it's his job to protect us. And we should be exceedingly courageous. And so there was no reason for them to uh, to run away from the people and to uh, to hightail it to the tent of the witness. Uh, listen, I'm no Moshe, and I wouldn't have done it. He shouldn't have done it either. The second thing is, oh my goodness, what's the fall on the faces stuff? Why would mm-hmm. you do that? God never told anyone to fall on their face. He never told anyone to bow down to him. In fact, everything he's talked about is about walking with him, standing upright in his presence, him lifting Lifting us up so Mm -hmm. that we can uh, live with him. In fact, most of the yatza withdrawal from Egypt, God uses the verb Allah, which means to lift us up, to raise Mm us. So the last thing, if, if he is investing all of this energy and time to Allah, raise us and lift us up, what in the heck are these guys doing falling down on their faces? Two mistakes. It won't be the last mistake that Moshe makes in this uh, circumstance. <sighs> Outnumbered by <clears throat> hundreds of thousands, <clears throat> they were likely seeking refuge from the malignant mob. Then perhaps embarrassed by not having stood up to them, they uh, did a nose plant, either falling or tripping, such that they were face down in the dirt. It, uh, it can happen. But that's the last thing God wanted, because when we fall on our faces, it inverts everything the covenant represents. Our Father wants to lift us up. And he wants us to look up to him. He doesn't want us looking down on the dirt. So this was not starting off well. And it was going to get worse. Even Moshe wasn't listening. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe for the purpose of saying, grasp hold of the staff and summon the community of witnesses. You should you and also your brother Aaron, the alternative, should speak to the stone before their eyes and it will give its water. And thereby you shall bring out for them water from this rocky crag and you will be providing a drink for the community of witnesses on behalf of the restoring testimony and also for their livestock. Okay. Pretty clear. Grab your staff. Mm -hmm. So the staff, he didn't say use the staff, did he? He said grab the staff. He said speak. Yeah. Well, grab the staff. So there's a reason he wanted Moshe holding the staff. Second, he said, I want you to speak to the stone. And I want you to speak to the stone before uh, the eyes of all Yisrael. Why speak to the stone? I mean, 
why not dig a well? Why not use the staff to perform some kind of miracle? No, I want you to speak to the stone. Just as I have spoken to these hard-headed numbskulls, I want you to show you that words matter and that you can use your words to resolve your problem. Uh, I am, uh, you know, as I think I've shared, I, I live in a, uh, in a Caribbean island. Uh, and I, this particular island is uh, 85 to 87% uh, black uh, and about 4 or 5% uh, Hispanic and less than 10% Caucasian. And there's a significant problem with the culture on this island with young blacks taking each other's lives at a, a prodigious rate and not being able to use their words to, rec- to resolve uh, disputes. And so the, to the best of my ability, I, I go into the community. I find young men that I think uh, are, have been counseled poorly and try to father them. Uh, and then I bring them uh, to the projects that I work on and and act as a mentor on uh, their behalf. I shared uh, uh, my dinner this uh, evening with uh, four such men and young men, first job that any of them have ever had. And and I mentor them like a uh, like a dad. Love these kids. Uh, and what one of the things that I constantly reinforce with them is how important words are and how important it is to uh, do the right thing, uh, say the right thing at the right reason and know how to use words and to stand up and be be accountable. And that's what Yahweh was asking of Moshe. Uh, This was a much higher level situation than me trying to take a a few young men out of the community and mentor them. He had hundreds of thousands and this, uh, he was revealing the Torah. It's it's a different thing, but the principles are the same. Yeah. The the principles are are quite similar. So Yahweh provided Moshe and Aaron with a clear and specific instruction of what he wanted to done. Um, He said, words matter. We're going to use our words. What is the Torah? Words. How does God reveal himself to us? Words. How does he guide us? Words. How does he teach us? Words. How do we come to know him? Words. Words matter. (laughs) I laugh because my old partner uh, uh, and uh, where I learned to write said, you know, I, with these amplified translations, he's made a religion of words. Uh, if, if you want to define religion as a devotion to, I am devoted to the words that Yahweh spoke. I think they're, they're these marvelous nuggets of truth, these great treasures that we can unwrap to meet and fall in love with the creator of the universe. Yeah. So, indeed, I... I adore these words. Uh, you do too, Kirk. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, amazing. It's yeah, nothing, nothing more fun. Uh, they were both of these men were asked to speak to the rocky crag, and then it would deliver as instructed. Moreover, since it was from a Sela that Yahweh first appeared to Moshe. <clears throat> The message is also that we should respond to Yahweh in kind. Remember, he first appeared <clears throat> to Moshe from Asela, from this rocky crag. And so God is saying, this is how I appeared to you, and I responded to you when we talked together. Uh, well, I communicated to you from the rocky crag of Mount Choreb. It talk to this rocky outcropping and just see what happens. God did not want Moshe to lash out at him. And Moshe grasped hold of the staff, the branch which is symbolic of the tribes which comprise the nation, 
from the presence of uh, Yahweh in the manner which he instructed him. Then Moshe summoned, along with Aaron, the contingent community to the presence of the rocky outcropping. And so, two things, so far so good. He's got his staff. He summoned the children of Israel. He is two for two so far. He then said to them, please, listen. Those of you who are rebellious and embittered, is it possible that from this crag, We will bring forth water for you. Before I go on, um, that's uh, the third mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I always said, I don't want you to uh, deal in hypotheticals. I want you to gather the people. I want you to speak to the rock. Everything will be cool. So Moshe decides to ad lib and said, do you think it's possible? It's kind of a dare. You think it's possible that that uh, that uh, those who are Iraq? yeah rebellious mm-hmm. and embittered uh, that uh, from this rock will come forth water? Uh, lots of things wrong here. <laughs> it wasn't on behalf of or for the malicious and embittered, the rebellious that this rock was going to perform. It was somebody who wasn't embittered, who was not religious, that would speak to the rock, and the rock would uh, perform. Well, God's brought the children of Israel who are embittered and made it sound like they can somehow get this rock to perform. No, they couldn't. And why the hypothetical? And what's the uh, the line from Star Wars that Yoda says? Don't try. Do or don't do. There is no try. But that's still how this is being uh, presented. Then Moshe raised up his hand and he struck the rocky outcropping with his staff. Twice. With two strikes. And Abundant waters came out. So the community of restoring testimony drank, as did their livestock. Therefore, Yahweh said to Moshe and to Aaron, well, let's, before we, uh, we do this, let's just think what they did here. The staff mm-hmm. was supposed to be symbolic. What is the staff primarily symbolic of? I, you know, I read uh, in the earlier one that the word for uh, for staff and uh, in Hebrew actually speaks of the uh, the twelve tribes that comprise the community yeah. of Israel. It's um, uh, mate. It also means uh, branch. Uh, mm-hmm. But the staff is the tool of a protection. A whole bunch of things. Yeah. From shepherd. What is the course. staff a tool of? A shepherd, right? Shepherd. And so mm-hmm. uh, God says, if you're going to have a leader, I want that leader to be a shepherd. And I want the leader to act like a shepherd. The difference is that uh, if you've got a king who is not a shepherd, he's going to live in his big old palace, and he's uh, going to treat the people uh, like they're a threat to him. Mm -hmm. And he is not going to walk with them or sleep with them or talk with them or hang with them uh, or protect them. That's not what the kings do. That's what shepherds do. Shepherds live with the sheep. They walk with the sheep. They uh, lead the uh, the sheep. They, uh, yeah, yeah, they they spend quality time together in a mutually beneficial way. That's the shepherd staff. So Moshe, as the shepherd, was tending to the needs of the sheep. That's what the staff represented. But rather than use the staff that way, he whacked the staff against the rock. No. Not trying to beat the, you're not trying to beat God. We're not trying to beat nope. the staff. We're not playing. Uh, no, beat the water, beat the rock. Yeah. Uh, however, <clears throat> you put you out in a bad spot. What do you think the children of Israel would have done if the rock had not yielded water after uh, Moshe had played truth and dare 
and struck the rock. So Yahweh does not mm-hmm. want to embarrass his man. No. So Moshe was the best he had to work with, was an extraordinary individual, and so the rock uh, uh, performed and, and gushed out water because the alternative was to put Moshe in a very bad light. And the alternative, which was Aaron, was not a good choice. And after Aaron, well, there was um, Coleb, and uh, there was um, Yosha, but there wasn't much mm-hmm. to draw to. No. And Moshe was at the end of his uh, uh, time anyway. So Yahweh, to his credit, did not embarrass Moshe yet. And that's important for us uh, too, Kirk, because it's comforting. when yeah. when you do what we do and you 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 do an extemporaneous well, radio program like this, or you write tens of thousands of pages of books and you post it all online, you're bound to make a mistake here and there. And now you're subject to criticism. But God's style is that if you're willing to work with Him and do the best job you can, He's got your back. Mm-hmm. He's going to protect his guy, even if his guy stumbles from time to time. He had Moshe's back. He protected his credibility. Yeah. The rock the rock performed, even though Moshe did not do what he was supposed to do. So God's going to talk to Moshe privately about what was wrong, but uh, he did not embarrass him in front of his people. Pretty cool for God to respond that mm-hmm. way. So yeah. therefore, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, actually. It's, it should make you comfortable uh, and be willing yeah. to do what we're doing here. Put your, yourself out on the, uh, on, uh, in the battle line, Front line sort of fighting, yeah. Yeah, fighting against religion and politics and all the things that are pop, uh, popular, uh, disgruntled individuals like the children of Israel. You should have the courage to go out there and do it knowing that even if you do occasionally trip over your tongue, that uh, that God's going to uh, support you. He's not going to tell you that what you did was right, but he is not going to let you hang out there uh, all on your, uh, your own. You're, you're part of a team, mm-hmm. and he is a pleasure to work for. So, therefore, Yahweh said to, uh, to Moshe and to Aaron, because uh, you did not place your trust in me, ooh, you were ooh. not you were not trustworthy. Ouch! Ouch! No kidding. Pri- he did it privately. I know. I know. For the purpose Still. of demonstrating that I am unique, special, and set apart before the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, the correct approach is that you will not bring this contingent community into the land, which to show the way to the benefits of the relationship I gave to them. Now, most people want to say, well, that's pretty meaner, meaner of God. Now, uh, you know, he he puts up with these people for 40 years, you know, meaner, meaner. uh, Okay, what's the big deal? Struck the rock, gave water, talk to the rock, give water. Uh, that's a pretty significant penalty. No, it isn't. It? It's not a penalty at all. <laughs> you know, it's a tremendous yeah, benefit. Yeah. God's saying, all right, all right, I, I get it. We've been doing this a long time. You had a senior moment. It's uh, We're just uh, going to move past it, uh, but uh, I'm not going to burden you with this uh, anymore. Uh, it, after a while, Dode burned out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's... It is hard. The responsibilities are significant. Uh, uh, I've done this now for 20 years, uh, averaging 10 hours a day, six and seven days a week. Uh, And there are moments where you say, you know, wow, I think I need a break. Uh, Time is short. The mission is important. And uh, and fortunately, uh, there are very few people willing to uh, to engage. And so we uh, we shoulder on and. And here, um, Moshe missed a lot of things. God said to let me, Moshe. Let me say, let me throw one thing in the group. <laughs> you know, I always I draw a little cartoon sometimes in my notes on this. And, I, and when I read this, 
I, I, I drew a little picture of all the all these little Israel stick figures all screaming and hollering, making a lot of noise in a big cloud. And I, you know what? A, what a, in cartoons they have a balloon, and if you do it, a lot of curves. It means someone's mm-hmm. thinking. I've got Moshe over there holding his stick, standing up, and he says, "Oh shucks, I can't be with these people anymore." <laughs> yeah. Oh shucks. I don't. Oh, yeah, shucks. oh shucks. Oh shucks. I don't have to do with these people anymore. Oh. Uh, uh, that, yeah, that works for me. Hurt me. Hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please. Please. Good. Could I be retired? Uh, you know, it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to tell you that uh, that is. I, I have the best of all circumstances. I live in paradise. Uh, I, uh, you know, look overlook the uh, the ocean. Beautiful sunrises as I begin each day. Beautiful long sunsets as I end each day. I, uh, this is a wonderful job. I live in a in a beautiful uh, place. But I'm I am going to push it to continue the the ten hours a day, uh, uh, six and seven days a week for as long as I'm able, uh, because. There is a a time where uh, God's going to say, you know, okay, you <laughs> thank you, you you did the job, uh, go take a rest. Uh, you know, you, you we've earned your rest, go take a rest. That's what he was essentially saying to Moshe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Moshe did it for much longer, much bigger, much 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 more difficult circumstance, but. It is important, and every time we read something that Yahweh says to one of his people, to personalize it. Bring it into your own life. Say, what what does this mean to uh, to me individually? So that's why I uh, I do this. I think it's uh, important that we all do it. Personalize it. Mm-hmm. The reason that Yahweh works through Moshe, as opposed to doing this himself, is because he wants us to personalize it. If God didn't want us to personalize it, there was no reason to have Moshe. You know, with with Moshe, we can see what works and what doesn't work. What God expects, what He doesn't expect. How He wants to work through us. When we, uh, what kind of things that we can do that uh, aren't effective. So, because you did not place your trust in Me and you were not trustworthy, He, you know, He came with this hypothetical. So, you think this rock is going to uh, mm-hmm. uh, give water? Yeah, sure enough. No, yeah. you know, you just say, listen, I went and talked to Yahweh. Uh, well, actually, I went to Yahweh, uh, and he talked to me. And uh, yeah, this is what God said. Yeah. He said, "Grab your staff, which is obviously symbolic. You want to, I want. He wants you to look at the staff and recognize that I'm here with you as the shepherd. And then he said, "I want you to go and talk to this rock." Those are the things he told me. Uh, well, at third, he said, "Gather all of you guys together." And then talk to the rock. Uh, so we're going to do exactly as God instructed, because that's really the whole purpose of the Torah. He says, if you listen to me and you do as I have asked, these wonderful things are going to happen. So this is an opportunity for you to tangibly demonstrate the Torah. Listen to me. Do as I have asked. Something good's going to happen. Right? So that's mm-hmm. all. That's what Moshe should have said. This is a teaching moment. Said no. He came up with this hypothetical kind of a dare, and then he uh, uh, misappropriated the uh, staff and whacked at the uh, at the rock. Can't listen to it. So you know he says to Moshe, "You you didn't trust me. You weren't trustworthy for the purpose of demonstrating that I'm unique, special, and set apart." And different, you know, and the in Egypt they were whacking stuff with their uh, their staffs and you know made uh, magic tricks happen. Um, oh yeah, Snakes people out there are yeah. whacking things with uh, with sticks. Uh, <laughs> the sticks become more and more powerful these days. But we've been whacking things for a long time. God says I'm different than that. And the thing that distinguishes God is the lack of whack. And the use of words. The thing that distinguishes God is the very thing I'm trying to instill in the young men's lives that I've become yeah, an island uh, father, which is stop no whacking stuff, lashing out at things, and use your words. In fact, even better than using your words, use God. Yeah. 
that's the life lesson here. And he said, if you had shared that life lesson, you would have demonstrated that I'm not like the uh, the pagan gods that are whacking stuff and lashing out at people. No. I am talking to you. And I'm hopeful that you will listen to me. For the purpose of demonstrating that I am unique, set apart, special, very different. And I want you to you had to have done that before the sights, the understanding, the perspective of the children of Israel. Therefore, the correct approach is that you will not bring this contingent community into the land, which to show the benefits of the relationship I gave them. These that are is an amazing ma'am. insight. That is an amazing insight, yeah. man, really. I mean, that out of that, do you? Wow. I mean, I'm, yeah. He, he, by the way, he didn't well, even say that I'm going to preclude them from going in. No, I made the promise they're going to go in. And yeah, they go in. Well, what we learned, too, is that Yahweh yeah, didn't uh, penalize uh, Moshe. He didn't embarrass Moshe, and then he didn't no. uh, penalize Moshe. What he gave Moshe was a flying adventure. Go, 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 go through, watch. Through the now, promised land. He took him under his arm, showed him the whole thing. So this yeah. is what it's uh, this is what it's all about. So he showed him the so he he went into the promised land. He got to see all of it. He just didn't have to herd these jackasses anymore. <laughs> I mean, what a deal! <laughs> what a deal! <laughs> Poor motion. But. Moshe could have done better. He yeah. could have done better. Yeah. So these are the uh, Mayam Meribah, the waters of contention. Beni Yisrael, the children of Yisrael, where they were contentious and quarrelsome with God, where they taunted and disputed and opposed and quarreled and were disagreeable with Almighty God. And through them, he demonstrated that he was different. That's that's interesting, isn't it? So even in the midst of all of this, um, Yahweh demonstrated that he, he was different. Set apart, yeah. Yeah, like set he's apart. different. The way he handled Moshe, the way he handled the rock, the way he handled the instruction, the way he handled the uh, uh, the Monday morning quarterbacking, where he said, okay, here's what, what, what happened that wasn't right. This is the opportunity that you missed, but by me taking the time to explain this to you and for it to be included in the Torah – we have an opportunity to teach. You have an yes. opportunity to think about this, and you'll see that I'm different. It's you know the in all of the religious myths, the characters that interact with the gods are are these mm-hmm. uh, you know, figures that are dashy soldiers and great heroes, or they're also uh, flawed individuals and have all sorts of uh, of perversions. God is saying, this is the way that I wanted to work with you. You listen to me. You act upon the instructions that I'm providing. And you will have a exceedingly positive result. And in doing that, you're going to see just how unique and different I am. And why is God being unique and different to the point? Because what were the Jews doing? They were worshiping false oh, gods. Him. Yeah, the yeah. thing that makes okay. Yahweh unique is that not only is he real, but that he reveals himself to us, not through these signs and wonders and these you know, lightning bolts and, uh, and upheavals in the heavens and wars with other gods. No, he reveals himself to us in the most amazing way, these words. These words that are the great treasures that we can analyze every one of them and learn from them. Words teach us. 
They enrich us. They enlighten us. They liberate us. They enable us to be part of a relationship. They help us come to know and understand our maker. And he is unique in this way. What a marvelous story. How Mm -hmm. God used the most despicable act of his people to be a teaching moment. So, what is God teaching us through this illustration? It is, as so many have claimed, proof that the God of the Torah must be obeyed. Is that what the lesson is? That he is quick to judge and condemn based upon a single, seemingly minor offense, and that's the religious lesson here. Mm -hmm. Sure, he asked Moshe to speak to the stone rather than strike it. But why then the insistence on taking his staff? Why did the rock produce water and quench everyone's thirst under these circumstances? Why were those who were dismissive of God and opposed to him allowed into the promised land and only Moshe, the greatest of the prophets, precluded? These are really interesting questions. Mm -hmm. What are we to make of what seems dangerous? How is it possible that the Israelites, who said that they would rather have died being religious with the rest of the Jews than live with Yahweh, who were clueless as to why they had been liberated and were oblivious to the message of the Torah, and yet they were allowed into Israel. Well, Moshe, the one who had made it possible for the rest of us to know Yahweh and engage in his covenant, was excluded. One would have thought that it would have been just the opposite. Now, the answers are mirrored in the waters of Meribah, Mm -hmm. because it serves as a reflecting pool. It's one designed by God to reveal what the Israelites had become and what they would remain. Yahweh recognized that there was no reason to speak to his people because they were not listening to him anyway. Like the Jews today playing religious dress-up with their fancy weasel hats. There is no merit in reasoning with them because they were anything but reasonable, like their religious descendants today. And there was no reason to judge them because they had already done this to themselves. The Waters of Meribah is a story of of an unwitting self-assessment and self-disclosure leading to self-determination. Now, as for the hero of our story, Moshe, like so many of the exceptional individuals along life's way who Yahweh has chosen to work alongside, he was a very good man, albeit an imperfect one. Sure, after 40 years of succeeding with Yahweh, of doing what would otherwise have been impossible, and while still mourning over his sister's death, he had an embarrassing moment. He should have stood up to an angry mob and not retreated to the tent of the witness. He ought to have not been stressed such that he fell on his face. Of course, he should have listened and done as Yahweh instructed. And even then, there was no reason to question whether or not the rocky crag would deliver as promised. For these missteps along the way, and for not capitalizing on the opportunity to go to the children of Israel and said, I just listened to Yahweh, and this is what he said to me. And that if I do as he has asked, this is going to be the benefit. And so I come with this staff to show that he is our shepherd and that I am representing him as your shepherd, 
And in so doing, I'm going to share these thoughts with you so that you might know him better and come to appreciate what he's offering. And therefore, I'm going to speak to this rock, and it's going to gush forth the water. Why? Because Yahweh said it would. I listened to him. I will have done as he asked, and he will always deliver on his promises. Mm-hmm. So, Israelites, that is the message of what's going to happen here. Now, let's do as Yahweh has said, and as we do, rather than just simply letting it quench your thirst, think about all that this represents, how unique a position we're in, how special is our God that he would teach us in this way and then reinforce his teaching. This is the life lesson of Mirabah that unfortunately was squandered. And yet, God was good enough to explain it to us. Now, there is more to this, and we will continue with with this analysis of, uh, of Moshe this time uh, next week. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, for contributing, JB. It's wonderful to uh, hear your voice yes, again. Yes, good to hear you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Kirk. Um, yes, sir. And uh, uh, for those, I think we're uh, we're reaching out. Um, I think somewhere in the Netherlands, uh, someplace in Northern Europe, was the uh, the marketing uh, uh, outreach uh, uh, today. Uh, thank you for those of you who have uh, listened. Give you a chance. Uh, you'll find everything we've talked about uh, in the uh, library of books called Yada, Yahweh. Yada means to know. Yahweh is God's name. Uh, there are 20-some-odd volumes that are posted for you to read in their entirety at yadayah.com. And uh, take advantage. Uh, time is short. And I want you to be able to get to know Yahweh. Um, the first step of that, of course, is that you will have to reject religion and politics. Uh, you can't be a progressive. You can't be a Herodim if you want to uh, to get to know Yahweh. You will have to do as Abraham did and walk away from your country, from the religious influences of Babel, uh, and then listen to Yahweh and act upon what he said. That was the lesson of the, Mer- of the waters of Meribah. It's the lesson of the Torah. It's the lesson of the covenant. And we um, we're pleased to be able to share it with you. So Shabbat Shalom. I uh, look forward to being with you uh, next week, and uh, we'll we'll uh, uh, continue to translate uh, to, to give you an update of where we are at this point. Is uh, about uh, a quarter of the way through the final chapter of uh, Volume Eight of Yada Yawa which means that it will be finished sometime over the next week. We'll get all the edits done. And uh, this volume that we are presenting this series of programs uh, from will be on the bookshelf and available for you to uh, to read along. Um, and I think that's probably going to be in two weeks' time that you should find it on the uh, on the bookshelf. So sometimes it's probably good just to Perfect. listen and not have to, uh, to validate it uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, is we, we're going to go through this entire volume. So before we even finish this chapter, the volume will be printed as volume eight of uh, Yada Yada, and you'll be able to follow along in the, uh, in the text uh, as we make our way through it. And the reason we're doing this particular volume is that it transitions into uh, Hosea uh, and uh, Hosea as the, uh, the English uh variation of it um, it means he saves uh, and there's probably no more uh, direct blunt assessment of God's people and how they have estranged themselves from God and have become uh, divorced and disinherited and the reasons that this has occurred and how to resolve this problem 
as you find in Hosha. It is a very eye-opening experience. Uh, I've just finished completely retranslating it and uh, sharing insights and commentary along the way. Uh, and I've actually finished the book of Hosha from beginning to end, every word. Uh, and because Yahweh brings up Shaul, Paul, at the uh, end of Hosha, uh, I felt uh, compelled to in, uh, include a review of Chabauk, which is the oh, most great. damning prophecy of all of the prophets. Uh, Chabauk is, was written to destroy the credibility of Paul, the author of the Christian New Testament, uh, and uh, the plague of death, and therefore the religion of Christianity is destroyed uh, in uh, Chabauk. And it's the first new translation I've done of that in a while. Um, and it's the first time that Chabauk has been included in the Yada Yahweh. It's always uh, been simply a part of, of question Question Paul. Paul, Uh, But it's a uh, it's a real fitting end of this chapter because or volume because while Hosha speaks directly to Yehudim to God's people um, from beginning to end, uh, Chabauk is is speaking about a Jew who uh, dropped out of rabbi school and started a religion that caused a number of things to happen to God's people that are so profound. He has devoted an entire prophetic revelation to this individual. And it's unusual for God to speak about something other than Judaism and its uh, uh, negative influence on his people. Uh, But in the case of Christianity it became the most anti-Semitic religion in, in history uh, and is the reason behind what uh, much of what Imperial Rome did is it uh, morphed from Imperial Rome into Roman Catholicism and created the hellish conditions for Jews throughout Europe uh, and much of the world for the next uh, almost 2,000 years. But it's also that because of of the caricature of uh, of the Christian Jesus Christ and turning him into the Son of God and uh, the Messiah, uh, that rabbis looked for an antidote, a, a way to rebuff the religion. And in so doing, uh, they ended up denying the Passover lamb, uh, costing Jews their soul. And so they're there really are two religions that are born out of the episode with uh, with what Paul did. And so God is exceedingly demonstrative in, uh, in his animosity. So that's the last uh, two chapters of uh, what will be the eighth volume of, um, of Yada Yahweh. So that's where we are in the, uh, the text. Um, long explanation, but I think a lot of you are, are interested yeah. in where we're going uh, and where we are at this point. And so we look forward to covering this volume with you. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Good night, uh, one and all. Uh, thank you, Kirk, and, uh, and uh, night, also yeah. JB for being part of the program. Good night. Yeah. Night, night, y'all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.